I've found that if you actually have confidence in in what you believe, mm-hmm. you're not threatened by conversations with other people who may differ with you on those things. And often you'll find there's one area where you may, though you disagree on everything else, agree on that one thing. And in working on that one thing, find that you actually have a lot more commonality. On In Good Faith, we believe that all faith traditions have something to teach us about how God is working in the world and in our lives. So join us to listen, learn, and be amazed. On today's episode of In Good Faith, we have two people who really have made themselves, and this was a process, become experts in fighting criticism with curiosity. And that makes me really happy. (laughs) We are in studio today with senior producer Heather Bigley. Happy New Year. And producers Ashton Rowan. Hi, it's good to be here with you, Steve. And Leah King. Hey, it's good to be back. We're going to start today with Jeff McCullough, who has this really interesting journey of being an evangelical pastor and then having this change of heart about how he talks about different religions. In this case, he picks the one I belong to. (laughs) Yes, and he has a very popular YouTube channel called Hello Saints. You may have seen it, where he does these highly professional, polished videos, talking to people and experiencing different aspects of LDS ritual and also LDS culture here in Utah. So it's, it's pretty fascinating stuff to watch. And the whole idea of fighting criticism with curiosity. Ashton, this seems like this is something that that you paid attention to. Yeah, I really like the way that he approaches his interfaith work with a confidence in his own beliefs and wanting to understand and help others understand. And it seems like he does this well because he's been through this process, that he had to learn how to, what he calls in the interview, he's going to describe holding tension and why that can be good. Usually we like to just avoid that. But a way of doing that that's actually productive I like how he talks about ways that we can build relationships across tradition by being willing to communicate with each other and just asking questions. Yeah. Well, he's good at it, Mm -hmm. although this time I get to ask all the questions. (laughs) So let's hear Jeff McCullough. He's going to talk to us about how he came to this idea of fighting criticism with curiosity. So my wife actually has a background in professional counseling and Mm -hmm. therapy. And one of the things that I've learned from her that's been incredibly helpful is just recognizing how often and for how long many of us, as we've processed through our own issues, you know, air quotes, is we can kind of take a shame-based approach where, oh, I can't believe I'm this way, I need to change, or I'm, I'm such a terrible person, I need to do better. And there's a, a counseling modality called internal family system that is essentially looking at the different parts that make us who we are. And rather than shaming ourselves to be inquisitive and compassionate. And as I've sort of learned that approach when it comes to just a therapeutic approach, and I started to apply that to a faith context, it started to resonate because so often religion can also be a platform for finger wagging and shaming uh, to others or even to ourselves. And when it came to engaging in Latter-day Saint evangelical dialogue, I just recognized right off the bat as I initially started to do some observing or scouting of the types of conversations out there that it was so argumentative and it was so finger wagging and shame based. And I just got this idea to say, well, what if we took this approach over here and instead of just attacking and being critical, it was more compassionate, it was more empathetic, it was more inquisitive. And that just sort of sparked in my mind this idea of engaging with somebody from a different faith background, having a different kind of conversation by fighting the critical impulses we have with curiosity. When we come from a critical posture, we're stating, I have all the answers, And I'm going to tell you why I'm right and why you're wrong. And then be totally surprised when that doesn't affect you or cause you to change. Exactly. As opposed to, oh, I, I see that we disagree here. 
I want to ask some questions so that I can better understand. And what that does is it allows us, one, to be more informed, but also to humanize the other person and to have compassion and empathy. And as a result, I think that's why Hello Saints has kind of taken off because taking that approach that's less cerebral, that's less pedantic, that's less, you know, apologetics focused allows you to connect just on a human level and to see each other as people. And that just opens the door for a relationship, which is, I think, what is resonating with people on Hello Saints. Absolutely. So it seems like you're in this interesting place almost as a mediator. Do you, yeah. Do you feel that? I do. So my my friend, uh, my friend Greg Matson from Quick Media, he's a Latter-day Saint content creator. He calls himself more of an ambassador than an apologist. And I think I resonate with that. It's, I'm going to go into this very comfortable with who I am within my context and with, within who, who I am, even within my, my faith tradition and heritage. But that doesn't mean that I can't in some way make headway within your faith context when it comes to a better, more informed understanding of one another. Right. So I think, yeah, I would, I would see me less as an apologist and more of sort of an ambassador to say, let me understand you better so that we can understand one another better. So you grew up being taught about God. Oh, yeah. Did you always believe that? Or have to go through a question of, okay, here's what I was taught. Now I'm old enough. I've got to figure out, is this really what I believe? Yeah. So in the Protestant tradition, we we hold scripture as central, as the, the revelation of God as far as who he is and his heart, what he's about, what is his mm-hmm. mission. My catechizing or my growing up learning the Bible was always something I was very comfortable with Mm -hmm. within the Protestant tradition. And, you know, that requires time reading the scriptures, letting people teach you the scriptures, and really commentating on it, helping understand what does this mean and how does it apply and how does this help us see God more clearly and his mission more clearly. And that commentary is really important But there's also a saying in the evangelical tradition that says the greatest commentary of the Bible is not written on pages, but is lived out in a life. And I had two parents who very much demonstrated who God was, not just in what they said they believed, but how they lived. And that commentary was a great testimony of who God is and what he's about. I saw the heart of God in the heart of my parents, in the relationship with each other, in the relationship with me and my brothers. So I think that growing up in that home with parents who didn't just instill religious truth in me, but lived out a relationship with Jesus before me, that's, was they're modeling that they're modeling that and yeah. it, it's really always been sort of central to who I am so then whenever I do go to college and I'm at a Wesleyan school where we're questioning what do we believe and why we believe it and I go through a season of doubt and I start to question what I believe which I had to I had to make it my own which required a bit of deconstruction right I had a firm foundation to stand on and my parents were just they're giving me the space to find my way and and to truly live in an incarnational sense a relationship with God so that I wasn't just going through the motions. And as a result, I, I think that that foundation, along with the ability to sort of question what I believe and why do I believe it, became just sort of reinforcement to this very personal relationship that I not only have with the Lord, but love to emulate and live out in my relationship with my wife and before my kids. All of those things are central before Jeff is a pastor or before Jeff is a YouTuber exploring another faith. That phrase, relationship with God, that becomes very personal. It's something that you can't really just hand to somebody else. You have to experience. But I'm wondering, can you put into words what that is for you? that you call your relationship with God? Sure. Yeah, I think there's a a couple different angles that I would look at it from to sort of define that. The first is um, just recognizing 
the, the faithfulness of God in my own life as I've pursued him. You know, one of my favorite books by a Protestant author, his name is A.W. Tozer. He's actually a uh, Christian Missionary Alliance guy. Mm. But he wrote a book called The Pursuit of God. And it's all about the fact that we were created to be in God's presence. We all intrinsically want that. So as a result, in a fallen state outside of the garden, where we don't have everything that God intends us to have, we're, we're reaching for him. Mm. And we, we reach for the wrong things a lot of times. So for me, I, I reached for, even though I grew up in a Christian home, I was still trying to find satisfaction in earthly things, carnal things, fleshly things, even things that are, are good, like a relationship with a girlfriend or a wife, always finding those things to fall short. And it wasn't until I was willing to fully surrender anything and everything to the Lord and to fully turn my life over to Him and realize that I didn't need to try to obtain or to, to apprehend meaning and purpose in this life, but that He is pursuing me. It begins to feel like a relationship. When I was 14, came to this realization that God doesn't want my religion he doesn't want my religious activity. He wants my heart. You know, the scriptures talk about sacrifices I don't desire, but a broken and contrite heart. And that was, that was a light bulb moment for me. And something changed in me. Something transformed. It was, it was a spiritual awakening. My eyes were open, and I began to see everything completely different. Um, Everything had different meaning, had different purpose. I had more uh, compassion for other people and a desire to help other people see who God is and what he desires for them. And, you know, like I said, that was sort of in middle school, but that relationship just continued to grow. And then as I faced life situations, you know, getting married and my wife having a, a medical situation that was pretty difficult or our first home falling into a coal mine, which actually happened. Oh boy. Or, um, you know, walking through just things that we all sort of have to maneuver through, the twists and turns in life, you know, the miscarriages and the disappointments and the letdowns and jobs and some of these other things. God's faithfulness has always been there, always. And so that has- start to build a level of trust in God that's, that will underlie whatever may come. Yeah, it's, it's trust as we see- his clear presence manifested. Um, he's not chiseled in granite sitting up on his throne waiting for us to get it right. He is involved. He is active by his spirit. And seeing how and when he shows up and, and then what that does to reinforce the ultimate of what he's done for us through his son, Jesus, which then points me to the ultimate hope that we have to look forward to. We are really interested at In Good Faith because we talk to people of different faiths about how people see their creator working in their lives. And so that's what was so appealing because you have this interesting interfaith aspect to what you do, both the curiosity and then kind of presenting it to people who may not have the time mm. to do what you're doing, sure. but are interested. Yeah. Who is your audience and has it turned out to be who you thought it would be? My audience is primarily Latter-day Saints. Interesting. That's not what I was expecting. That was my guess. I was anticipating it being sort of a, an even split mm -hmm. between either devout Latter-day Saints or Latter-day Saints who might be going through a deconstruction. I mean, a lot of this came up for me during the pandemic when faith deconstruction or church deconstruction really hit in yeah. a lot of faith groups. All over. Yeah. And, and so I, I figured it would be individuals in the Latter-day Saint world and also in the evangelical world who were either devout, wanting to learn more about Latter-day Saint tradition, or um, maybe even evangelicals who were in their own deconstruction, trying to understand what other people believe. But I know it's very clear that my primary audience is a Latter-day Saint, mainly devout, but some not quite as either devout or maybe even some who are questioning what they believe. Um, and are they curious, like, oh, here's an outsider's view. I'm curious to know what that view is. Is yeah. that what draws them? Yeah, I think I think it is. And I also think that it's just, it's tied to the fact that I'm taking this approach that is non-threatening. You know, so often it's like, okay, you're from a different faith background. 
why are we talking about religion then, right? It's almost like in a political sense, like, oh, you're you're of a different political party than me? Okay, so how do we talk about this? Yeah, we can't possibly have any common ground. Yeah, like what is there to talk about? We disagree, we're just mm. going to argue. And I just refuse to do that. I, I think that, again, we can have the courage to be honest about what we believe and to be at peace there. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's another aspect to what I, I think people are resonating with is that I'm not trying to drag you out of your church, even though I'm from a different faith background, nor am I trying to join your church. Right. We, we can have this conversation and allow there to be, and this is a really important word I don't use very often, but it really is at the heart of this. Let's maintain tension. Tension is good because what it allows us to do is to remain true on one end and true on the other end and to sort of explore the middle there. It doesn't have to require me to rush to your side or you to rush to my side. And um, how long am I going to do this is as long as there's a willingness to have a conversation. Mm. And there's plenty to talk about. Um, I'm learning. That's a big part of what Hello Saints is. I'm exploring. There's a lot to explore in Latter-day Saint tradition. There are a lot of beliefs. There are a lot of scriptures. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of culture. Now that I'm in Utah, I'm experiencing a lot of that firsthand. So as long as there is— I want to say congratulations and also, I'm so sorry. (laughs) As long as it seems like the conversation is valuable and we are successfully with charity and compassion and love for one another, giving each other the room to know one another, to understand and be understood, and for us ultimately to constantly look to the rallying point of who Jesus is and how he fits into this whole conversation. Um, I have no plans to end this. I, I want to continue that conversation. Do you feel like you have to teach people how to hold that tension and not go to either contempt or criticism? Is that a skill that we have to learn as as believers or, or people in general? It's a skill that I'm still learning. There's a reason why I use the word fight mm-hmm. when I say fight criticism with curiosity. Criticism is a powerful force in our lives, and we all do it naturally. So for me, yeah, I mean, what I'm doing is I'm putting on display my own attempt to fight a very natural criticism that I could have. In fact, I released a video last fall where I was basically just being up front. Like, I used to have an incredibly harsh, critical idea about Latter-day Saints, and I would say harsh things about Latter-day Saint beliefs and traditions, Mm -hmm. and... I don't want to do that anymore. It was sort of this repentant, like, I'm sorry. I want to turn from that posture. And I have never at any point gone into this claiming, I'm doing this right, and I've got it down perfectly. (laughs) It's more of, I want to try this out. It's going to be tricky, and it's going to be difficult. It is in a sense, yeah. But uh, there's something real about that, and real is refreshing, so has parenting changed your or, or enlarged your understanding of God? I think it inevitably it has to because he is definitely personal. He is knowable. He is relational, but he is also transcendent. But that's sort of the beauty of what we even see in the Lord's Prayer where he invites his, his disciples to say, when you talk to God, you say, our Father, like, because that's the type of relationship he wants and desires and is always intended to have with that us. That closeness and that... That intimacy. That commitment. That's right. Um, in other passages of scriptures, whenever we, we're, we're crying out to God and we're calling him Abba, mm-hmm. right? I mean, in, in that context, that literally is the idea of daddy, not just father, but daddy. So then when you have a child and that intrinsic love is present and you're able to interact with that child and to have the same sentiment, care, passionate desire for your kids that you now see in the scriptures articulating God's passionate desire for us. So often we have this deistic view of God where he is, he's removed, he is absent, he is uninterested, and that can't be further from the truth. So in my deepest desires for my kids, I'm always reminded that my kids have desires. Like my son, he he wants to play video games, which is fine. My daughter wants to take acting classes, which is fine. My desires for them are greater. <laughs> you know, they're greater in scope and they're greater mm-hmm. in heart and they're greater in passion. And to to be in a relationship with a God 
with all the desires that I have, who wants more for me is powerful. And, and that relationship then just becomes so much more, it's just, it's deeper and it goes both ways. I, I've found that deepening my relationship with my kids and deepening my relationship with God. This is In Good Faith. We'll be back with more in just a moment. Hi, this is Stephen Cap Perry, and I'd love to recommend one of our BYU Radio family of podcasts for you. It's called The Appleseed. It's filled with stories for you and your family. Every episode features really excellent nationally known storytellers sharing all kinds of folk tales, fairy tales, personal and family stories. It's great to put on and listen to for road trips or bedtime for kids or anytime you want something to get the whole family not only listening, but then those stories generate conversations. And it's so easy to say, hey, do you have a story about this? Or, oh, that reminds me of when grandma said, or whatever it might be. Check out the Appleseed podcast. You'll have fun, and you might learn some new stories from your own family members. We're back with more of this episode of In Good Faith. Relationships can be journeys. They don't stay in the same place. They change over time as we change, whether age, circumstances, all of that. What do you know now or where are you now in your relationship with God or faith than you were 20 years ago, 25 mm. years ago? It's a great question. You know, being in pastoral ministry where you're stewarding a flock and you're living life with people, is eye-opening mm. because when we are in Sunday school or when we're going to church week after week and we're hearing sermons or we're hearing these perfectly produced songs articulating the greatness of God, all things that are true, but in a sense, cleaned up, sanitized, processed, refined. In, in tune. <laughs> that's right, in tune. And that's not life. Mm. Life is dissonant. And it is messy and unexpected. I think that's what I've learned now in my 40s, that I had a hard time grasping for a while. And it, it took for me being in ministry and I think living life, going through just seasons of life with my family, to recognize that God is not looking for the perfectly cleaned up, sanitized, refined life. He is one who is willing to enter into the muck and into the dysfunction and into the messiness. I just was able to experience that as I was pastoring, you know, walking people through marriage complications or through an unexpected death or through illness um, or through betrayal or through faith crisis. I, I could keep going because I did it for 15 years. I'm still, I'm still right now walking through a very difficult situation with the church here in Utah who's going through a leadership change and it is messy. Mm. But that's what God does. He rushes into the mess. That, that's the beauty of who he is. That's the beauty of John 3, 16, right? He, yeah. he loves the world so much that he sends his son into it. And not to condemn it. Not to condemn, but to save. That's right. And that is at the heart of God. I love Paul's letters in the New Testament because he is always writing into incredibly messy, dysfunctional situations. And providing light and clarity and more than anything, showing the heart of God. And I, I think I'm just, I'm realizing that more in my journey, whether you're looking at Paul's letters uh, to groups of believers who weren't getting it right and, and really needed to have some mess cleaned up and to see God more clearly and to surrender more to Jesus so that they could be in deeper relationship with him. But then I look back at the Psalms and I see the same thing, how raw and honest David was as he's crying out to God yeah. and how God can handle that. He can handle our messiness. He can handle our honesty. And that, that has been really um, apparent for me in my life, especially over the past few years in my relationship with the Lord. Mm. We talked about God sort of directing and pursuing us, sometimes pursuing us maybe to point us in a particular direction. Have you come to feel a sense of mission about what you're doing with YouTube? A thing that didn't even exist when you were deciding on where am I going to go with my life? That's right. 
Yeah. If anything, I think the whole YouTube experience, social media experience, and just moving into that area is recognizing how important it is for us to be aware of where people are. Mm -hmm. And that's where we should try to have the conversations. In the evangelical world, we make the mistake too often of just trying to invite people to church. That's not really where people are. We're better off to have conversations with people about faith where it naturally might emerge when they're at work or when they're at the neighborhood barbecue. Mm. That's when a more natural, less awkward, less forced conversation can be had. And this goes back even to the scriptures. You know, why did the disciples, even in the Acts, spend so much time at the temple or in the synagogues? Because those were community gathering places. So if they were going to share the gospel of Jesus, they were going to go where people Mm. were hanging out. And we can dismiss social media because of all the stigmas attached to those platforms. But that's where people spend their time. So when I'm considering doing Hello Saints, and a lot of the thought behind that is I don't see a lot of pastors interacting with Latter-day Saints in the world. And I don't think a lot of Latter-day Saints interact with a pastor. So I'll go to them on YouTube. I'll go to them on Instagram and provide that opportunity. And I think just being open to where people are, where they're consuming, not just content, but where they're interacting relationally is never something we should dismiss when it comes to how God might be able to use us in conversations. So that was Jeff McCullough from Hello Saints answering all of Steve's questions. And I liked what he says about asking questions of each other. It reminded me of high school. I went to high school in Wisconsin and I was the only Latter-day Saint in my grade of 500 people. Mm -hmm. And so people would often come up to me and ask questions. And I appreciated when they were genuine and curious and just wanted to know more about this religion that they've kind of heard about, but really didn't know. And I think that's something when we go into our next interview with Russell Moore. He's saying the young folks want to ask questions. They're not wanting to abandon their faith. They want to ask questions. They want to they want to know more from those of us who've been around a little longer. Yeah. And I really like we're seeing two generations here. Jeff McCullough is not a podcaster, except he sort of is because his YouTube channel works like a podcast. Of course, he has the advantage there on YouTube that he can take us places and show us lots of different places. Russell Moore comes originally from a print medium. He's the editor-in-chief of Christianity Today and the author of a book that just came out in July, Losing Our Religion, an Altar Call for Evangelical America. He hosts the weekly podcast, The Russell Moore Show, and he's co-host of Christianity Today's weekly news and analysis podcast, The Bulletin. What I appreciated a lot about Russell Moore's interview And the way I feel like it really connected to Jeff McCullough's was the way he also talked about conversations and entering conversations with a desire to learn and to improve. And he didn't use the word curious the way Jeff did, but I felt like it was the same idea. I started off by asking Russell Moore what the vision of Christianity today is and how that holds with or changes the original vision of the founder, Billy Graham. Well, CT has always had a a commitment to a positive gospel-centered vision of evangelical Christianity that differed both from an angry sort of anti-intellectual fundamentalism and a liberalizing uh, Protestantism. So it was a a different vision, especially in the 1950s when Billy Graham was forming this, from what uh, most Americans were accustomed to hearing uh, from conservative Protestants. So we're still in continuity with that uh, vision, biblical orthodoxy and a commitment to loving people and to to the sort of uh, intellectual engagement and in good faith, a sort of uh, conversations between people who might disagree. I was really interested in what grew out of your experience in youth ministry. Well, I started out in ministry, in youth ministry, while I was a seminary student. And this was, I thought, just something I was going to do for a little while. And it wasn't until later that I realized almost everything that I've done in my life since, I learned all the lessons I needed to know doing youth ministry. Because they're all the same. Same problems. It doesn't matter if it's 
the Vatican, the White House, uh, <laughs> local congregation, <laughs> a senior, a, a senior assisted living home. They all have those same uh, issues of who gets along with whom, who doesn't want to be seen with whom, who wants to feel important to whom, all of those uh, sorts of questions. And I also saw in the particular kind of youth ministry I was doing, I was dealing both with some kids who were culturally Christian, they'd always grown up in the church, but were sort of numb and almost inoculated to faith. Mm. And then a lot of kids who came out of completely unchurched backgrounds, never had met religious people even before, who didn't really know how to act in a church, but who couldn't believe that there were people who believed that uh, death is not the end, uh, for instance. Uh-huh. And so they actually had a sense of the strangeness in the right way of of what I believe the Christian gospel to be. And so it it sort of served as a metaphor for me for the rest of uh, for the rest of life. Well, I have just enough experience as a former scout master to, uh-huh. to, I think, say amen to everything that you just said. What do you see as hopeful signs? Where do you see possibilities of maybe? being friendlier in some of those theological divisions? When I, the the younger one goes, at least in in my uh, evangelical Christian community, the younger one goes, the more hopeful I am Mm. in a lot of ways. Although there are unique challenges with disillusionment and cynicism, and, and a lot of it rightly earned cynicism. I also am noticing when I'm on a college campus talking to Christian students, um, the number one question they're asking me is, how do I pray? Interesting. How do I spend time in in the Bible? So so they haven't learned that necessarily. Well, they've learned that they should do it, Mm -hmm. and they do it, but they haven't had the kind of mentoring that they actually would like. And so I'm, I'm finding myself saying to older evangelicals often who think, well, the the young Christians don't want uh, anything from us. The number one thing they're asking for is mentoring and connection, and they don't know how to do that because as, as one student said to me one time, how, how does one ask somebody to be a mentor? It's, it's like going up to someone and saying, will you be my friend? Yeah, yeah. And so there's that, and it's also I see as both a negative and a positive sign after that question, the second most oft, often asked question is, how do I deal with my parents who have become radicalized by conspiracy theories or who want to argue politics all the time? That's, that's a negative uh, reality. But what's positive is that I'm never being asked, how do I win an argument with my parents uh. or how do I get away from my parents? It's always, I want to connect with my parents. I love my mom and dad or whoever the extended family member is. How do I, how do, I do that in a way that doesn't just end up in some of these divisive, polarizing conversations? I'd like to, in a minute, come back to some of that. And you must have developed a particularly thick skin to still be doing what you do in some ways. I don't know. I don't think it's particularly thick. No. <laughs> but I wonder if, uh, on In Good Faith, we do love to know about people's faith journeys. Mm-hmm. And did you grow up in a believing home? Do you remember hearing about God and the first times you thought, I I think this is real. I I grew up in a Southern Baptist church that had been pastored by my grandfather. Mm. Uh, He had retired before I was born there. But it was a very cohesive community, very clear gospel articulation, wasn't a perfect church by any means. But I was able to see not just uh, what I believe taught, but also to see it demonstrated in many real and tangible ways. So I came to f- personal uh, faith in Christ at about 11 or 12 uh, years old and went through a faith crisis at about the age of 15. Um, Does it sort of seem on schedule for normal development? <laughs> well, kind of, except that what I was what I was worried about is I was looking around and saying, what if this is all just politics or Uh Southern culture and Jesus is the hood ornament on the top of it. And so there was a sense of, is this all just a means to an end? And I spent a considerable time working through that. I didn't have 
many people to talk about to about it, but I just went through it. And thankfully, I'd read the Chronicles of Narnia so many times as a kid that I recognized the name C.S. Lewis on the spine of a book. And mere Christianity really was the mechanism to pull me out of that. Not because of the arguments in mere Christianity, although those are good and sound. It was more the tone of voice that came through that Lewis obviously wasn't trying to sell me anything or to mobilize me. He was actually bearing witness to something true and real and beautiful. And that helped me to work through that process. And I suppose that's why I have, for the the rest of my, my life, I have a burden for people who are in that situation I was in when I was 15 and who really are not wanting to walk away from what they believe, but who are genuinely afraid, what if it's not true? What if it's not real? What if it's something yeah, else? Yeah. Yeah. And so him bearing witness, really, of through his personal experience and his insights, for young people today, if they heard more of people's personal conversion and connection to Christ, would that help them get there sooner, do you think? Ra- rather than just, here are the rules we live by and, and all of that, hearing the adults, the mentoring, I guess. What yeah, I'm I think if they, if they see people for whom... The faith is itself the first thing Mm. and that everything else comes after that rather than the faith being a means to prop up something else. And I think that's, that's one of the really disillusioning things that we see right now is kind of a grouping of people who would be together no matter what and who are at odds with people they would be at odds with no matter what. That causes people to wonder, is this just that? Yeah, I haven't heard it put that way. And We'd be together anyway, but because we're together, we're also here in this same church. Right, right. Mm. And, and I think that that's, that's one of the things that, that I see very different in both the ministry of Jesus and in the life of the early church in the book of Acts, for instance, is that you have this shaking up and putting together of people who may have had nothing else in common except for the following of, of Jesus, and it created quite a bit of disruption yes. <laughs> throughout, throughout <laughs> the early church era, but it also created a, a kind of power and witness to what's really true and what's really important, what really matters. One of the things I enjoy about being part of a local interfaith association is that chance to to meet people I would not have met mm-hmm. just in my, my daily life and to rub shoulders. And I wonder, if is there sort of a secret sauce or, or idea for you because you do so much interacting with people that you may think, well, theologically, we are not quite on the same page yeah. or maybe even very different. And yet we are here to work together. What is it that helps you do that? Well, I think because for me, it's really not a least common denominator Mm. conversation. So I never show up as anything less than what I actually am. And a, a conservative evangelical Protestant who believes the creeds and confessions, I believe. And I've found that if you actually have confidence in, in what you believe, mm-hmm. you're not threatened by conversations with other people who may differ with you on those things. And often you'll find there's one area where you may, though you disagree on everything else, agree on that one thing. And in working on that one thing, find that you actually have a lot more commonality than before. I mean, I'm right before I came in here, I'm texting with a friend of mine that I text with all day, every day, who's a very secular, progressive Muslim. We started working together on some refugee issues 15 years ago or so and realized in that we actually really love each other and appreciate each other and uh, don't agree on everything and don't have to. And I think that when people have those sorts of encounters, it actually, to tie it to what we were just talking about, I find that there are a lot of people, if they grow up with a caricature of the people who disagree with them, Uh and then they meet those people, and they realize, wait, these aren't evil cartoon characters or supervillains in a lair, it throws them. And they they don't know how to deal with that 
So I had a, a mother of a college student came up to me at my church one day and said, my, my daughter is having a theological crisis at her university. And I assumed it was anti-supernaturalism or something like that. And she said, no, it's because she's with a lot of atheist and agnostic students and she sees love, joy, peace, gentleness, <laughs> kindness, and it throws her. Well, of course, there's a, a very biblical Christian reason why you should expect those things mm. in everybody created in the image of God, but she wasn't ready for it. Mm. And if you if you have people who actually have confidence in what it is that they believe and really do believe in the possibility of persuading one another, even if just on one little issue mm -hmm. with which one can work together, that's a path forward. Beautifully stated. That whole idea that you have to be all of who you are to show up and feel like you actually belong there. And the other person from a different faith has to be able to show up as all of who they are. Yeah. Not we pretend and we, we, we skirt around the edges of things. Yeah. Yeah, I think there are some people who think faith itself is the most important thing. And faith in what or whom is relatively unimportant. That's not who I am. Uh -huh. It's not a matter of as long as we all can get on the same page where we're faithful people or behaving people, then we're all together. I think that's artificial and wrong, and for me it leads in some really bad directions. But I also have found there are all kinds of people who, uh, who are actually curious about what other people believe, who really want to. Yeah. I taught last year at a very secular university where I think all of my students uh, were from completely secular backgrounds and most of them had never met an evangelical Christian until me. And the questions they were asking one after the other after the other were theological questions because they really uh, wanted to talk to somebody who wasn't scared or embarrassed about those things and, and they could actually have a conversation. I think, I think we need more of that. This is In Good Faith. We'll be back with more in just a moment. Hi, Stephen Cap Perry here, host of In Good Faith. Here's another podcast from our BYU Radio family of podcasts I hope you'll check out. What I love is real. You know that saying, real recognize real? That's Lisa on The Lisa Show. Lisa Valentine Clark is a comedian. She's a believer, a single mother. And on The Lisa Show podcast, you will hear from the Council of Moms, a genius idea, which is actually one of my favorite parts of her show. And you'll hear about the challenges of life, parenting, mental health questions, social issues. Yes, you'll hear from experts, but also from people discussing their where the rubber meets the road life experience. It's The Lisa Show, wherever you get your podcasts. We're back with more of this episode of In Good Faith. Are there particular things that are your reasons for believing in God? I think that I am convinced by the person of Jesus. I really believe for both intellectual and experiential reasons that the resurrection actually happened. And that means that I'm very attentive to the authority of what it is that Jesus says. There's a, there's a novelist, essayist, uh, Frederick Buechner, who uh, said at one point, I, I can't really articulate in terms of a syllogism or an abstraction. I can just tell you there's something about the voice of Jesus that inclines me to follow him. And I think that's, I think that's true. If you notice the way that Jesus is calling all of his disciples in the Gospels, come and see. Mm, and, yes. and then they do. And so I, I really have become convinced that Jesus is who he said he was and the gospel is what, is what it is. And then I've seen that demonstrated and lived out. So as Jesus says, the, the spirit blows where he wills, the wind goes and you don't see it, but you see the results. And I have seen that. There are times when for me, flipping through a red letter Bible on, mm -hmm. on a bad day, mm -hmm. 
finding the red letters, that's where I go on the rough days because there is something about what he said and what he did and hearing it directly that's pretty uplifting and pretty encouraging to me. Yeah, and it's also true that you have in Jesus somebody who was both scandalously offensive. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And gentle Mm. and not uh, personally threatened or insulted by talking to, uh, for instance, a Samaritan woman who disagrees with much of what it is that he he was saying. I think that's, that's one little glimmer at somebody who actually, as he put it, knew where he was coming from and where he was going and who mm. he was. I mean, I think that's, that's the case. I think we all have different ways of feeling guided. Are there particular ways you have felt led or prepared or guided to the kind of things you do today? You know, I think I would have a different answer for that than I would have, say, 15 years ago. Mm. Because for a long time, I was very suspicious of language along the lines of, I feel God leading me, Uh. or I think God is saying to me, because I saw that used in my context in some really, really awful ways in which Mm. uh, you you just had subjectivity defined as, (laughs) this is God leading me. But as, as time has gone on, I have seen most of the major decisions that I've made in my life It's a voice that is calling and a following, but it's not a map. Yeah. So there's 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 just enough light from the pillar of fire for the next step, and I find that I'm the kind of person who would like a map. I I would like to have everything join the club (laughs) detailed and all of the mystery taken out. But that's not what what life is, and not who God is. It sounds like you have become also comfortable with that situation of not knowing. Yes, I have. And and part of the reason for that is because, and I've seen that not just in my own life, but in uh, in everybody that I deal with at a really authentic level. Almost everybody who has had a genuine experience with God, I have never met anybody and I have never seen in my own life the most important of those happening at moments of triumph. They almost always are times when at the moment, God seems to be absent or silent. And I'm I'm at the moment saying, where is God? I can't see where it is that I'm going. And it's only looking backward that I'm able to see God was doing all of these things with me and for me that I couldn't recognize then. And I I think that's the way that it works. So I have become more comfortable with, I don't know where you're going, but I know you and I trust you. So even at a moment like that, thinking this would be a great time to show up, where are you? Yeah. You've still taken the steps ahead. Yeah. One time I was going through a really difficult time. I spent a lot of time in the life of Elijah. I had always thought of him first as the prophet who's in the contest with the the prophets of Baal and calling down fire, calling down literal fire from heaven. (laughs) But what I saw is that the the center of the narrative about Elijah in 1 Kings is not that. It's in the wilderness in which Elijah feels as though he's completely abandoned. I'm, and I am alone and left. And God is present, not in the earthquake and not in the whirlwind and not in the fire, but but in this often translated a still small voice, but more accurately, the sound of thinnest silence. Mm. God is is there. And I, I think there's much to be much to be learned from that. And I've I've certainly seen that in my own life. What brings you the most joy in your faith life? I find that I am reached most deeply often by hymnody and a a, a particular kind of hymnody that I grew up with that transcended generations. And also with, I'm a 
a, a very low church uh, Baptist, but one of the things that's been really important to me, and I didn't even know it was important to me, is the uh, Anglican Book of Common Prayer, because every one of our wedding ceremonies was from the Book of Common Prayer. We didn't know it, but it was. <laughs> and all of our funeral liturgies was from the, the Book of Common Prayer. And what I found to be so enlivening and important about that is that when I'm at a wedding and I hear the exact same vows that I made and that my parents made, and when I'm at uh, preaching the funeral of my dad and knowing these were the exact same words that I heard at the funeral of my grandfather and they're the exact same words that will be said at my own funeral, there's a sense of continuity there that's that, that's really life-giving for me. That was Russell Moore talking to Steve, and I really liked Russell Moore's emphasis on youth and his experience with youth ministry. And one story I really liked that he told was from his own youth, where he talked about when he was young and when he really gained a testimony and a belief was he saw the Bible and its teachings being demonstrated in tangible ways by other people in his life. And he also connected with Jeff in that way when Jeff was talking about his own parents and their demonstration and their lived religion. And I really loved the way they both talked about that in their own youths. And talking about working with youth, when when people are asking him, how do I pray? I mean, they know, but they want to hear from somebody who has experience. They want some mentoring and don't know always how to do that. And then my favorite was, how do I deal with my parents who have been radicalized? <laughs> yeah. By what they were watching and what they're listening to. What an interesting thing that it's the younger generation and maybe the middle generation. I'm just barely there. Um, wondering what happened. I just love the idea, Steve, of you asking that about your mom. <laughs> <laughs> she's not too radical. Okay. Even, even at 85, she's not 85. too radical. At the end of his interview, he talks about a funeral and how the same words that were spoken at his father's funeral will be, will be spoken at his. And I love the idea of ritual. We had a whole episode about that if you want to hear more, but the idea of ritual and the power of repeated language. And he really honors those who, as he described it, have a genuine relationship with God and that people have developed those, not usually in moments of triumph and success, but actually sort of the, I'm holding on at the end of my rope. Yeah. Sadly, we don't always love that we're going to get there, but we have those experiences mm -hmm. and those moments. And I would just say, amen. Yeah, both of these men really wanted to talk about how our lives are messy, and that's why God's there, right? He's not there and for the God when is we're not perfect. God is not surprised by the messiness. Right. <laughs> He's like, what? You got dirty on your trip through the mud puddles? <laughs> <laughs> that I created for you to go play in. <laughs> yes. Um and that, to me, is really moving and a reminder in my own life that I don't have to show up in front of God in my patent leather shoes with my hair done, but uh, he's there to help me through all the times when I need him the most. So. so two different mediums from YouTube, from podcasting, also print and online, both of them, but a really good little course in fighting criticism with curiosity and reminding us to pick curiosity as our first tool for having those conversations. Many thanks to Jeff McCullough and Russell Moore for speaking with us today. This episode was produced by Heather Bigley. Our production team also includes Leah King, Katarina Martinez, and Ashton Rowan. Our sound designer is Daniel Phillips. To see extended interviews and on-location videos and more, go to the In Good Faith YouTube channel. Find us at youtube.com slash at in hyphen good hyphen faith. In Good Faith is committed to the idea that we all benefit from hearing people of widely varying backgrounds share their personal experience with faith and belief. In fact, we think people with such experience deserve some of our best listening. If interfaith understanding is important to you, be sure and leave a comment or review on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts and help spread the word. Find us on Twitter at In Good Faith Pod and on Instagram and Facebook at In Good Faith Podcast. In Good Faith is a production of BYU Radio. I'm Stephen Cap Perry. I hope you join me again soon right here in Good Faith. <laughs>